Okay, so I think uh, while people will continue to join in, uh, let's get started and kind of, uh, you know, make the best use of the time that we've got at hand, uh, Frank. First of all, thank you so much for uh, joining in for this coffee chat. I've been running in for almost about a year and a half now. Uh, I've spoken to some phenomenal leaders across various verticals, industries, solving different kinds of problems, be it a business, be it technology, be it a vertical problem or be it a um, humans in the loop problem, keeping in mind diversity, equity, inclusion, impact sourcing, whole lot. So I think uh, this one is something which is uh, catching uh, lots and lots of eyeballs in terms of the way uh, AI ops uh, and various aspects wherein how to build a robust data model or machine learning model uh, has been picking up uh, for quite a while. So without wasting much of our time, uh, Frank, it would be good to get started, uh, you know, with background uh, of obviously, you know, your experience, you've done lots and lots of things, including your stint at Nokia, Cyclomedia, taking it to the peak, doing a lot of things there. So let's get started with a quick round of introduction about uh, how has been the journey so far? What problems did you pick? How did you pick those problems? And what were you largely trying to solve? Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's a that's a number of questions, right? But but starting and then feel feel free to to add to, to that. So uh, as far as my personal experience is concerned, uh, I have been the CEO of Cycle Media for about nine and a half years. Uh, Took a step back late late last year, still involved, but not on a on a day to day basis as CEO anymore. And prior to that, it was six years with with here with the with the mapping company, right? Certainly, certainly at the time, uh, running the um, the product side of the business for for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So I have been in in location based businesses for the last fifteen years. Um, as far as Sector Media is concerned, uh, Sector Media is a company based out of the Netherlands. Um, the history is much longer than, than the nine and a half years I've been involved. The company was founded over 41 years ago. That sounds long, right? With with modern cloud-based digital businesses. But I but I always add to that that the first half of the history, it was not a real, not a real business, not a real company. It was it was a spin-out from Delft University of Geodesy. Uh, and, and initially quite focused on, on research activities. And then the company turned uh, turned commercial um, close to the year 2000. And, and from there on, we've been building building a more commercial business um, with, with quite a bit of success. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Um, probably good in, in terms of the context for this conversation. So, so Saxomedia is, is not a not an analytics only business, right? The the background is on the data side of things and then data still is is part of significant part of the DNA. And and when we at Cycle Media think about insights and, and analytics, it's always in combination with our own data, uh, which is obviously different compared to many other businesses that focus on, on insights. Um, so Cycle Media is all about uh, visualize, visualizing the external world, right? Visualizing public space, that's also important. Not so much focus on, on private areas owned by one individual or about one business, but about a public space, which in the end is is owned by all of it, by all of us. Uh, that's what Cyclomedia focuses on. Uh, core product is, if you want, the, the most accurate 360-degree uh, street-level data platform and data then is, is a hybrid both of uh, of imagery as well as of uh, lidar point clouds that's always a starting point of what the company does that that data has value on its own right there there are quite a few customers that consume that data to to do their their own use cases um all the data is stored in uh, in the cloud every week about 45 million clicks on that database so so that data is being consumed as data but obviously with the size of data growing on the one hand with uh, the complexity of the questions that our customers are trying to answer um, getting larger and with technology right including machine learning ai cloud computing becoming more broadly available uh, we've added an analytics component to that to that business but but it's important also for the rest of our conversation 
that in this business, we always think about the marriage between the two. And as a business, we're, we're not in, in the standalone analytics business based on available data or open data or other, other people's data for, for that matter. Great. I think, uh, I think this is just amazing. Wondering, uh, you know, from how you picked up, uh, you know, uh, Cyclomedia from being more of a not-for-profit to a for-profit business, off late machine learning operations and, uh, you know, building robust models have become widely popular for various use cases. And uh, I think top two use cases that come to my mind includes uh, autonomous vehicle use case, as well as medical AI, right? So uh, from a business perspective, uh, what are the top use cases that you have looked at? And uh, what has been largely the approach to solve the problem through whatever on the feed street and technology operations that you've got, uh, that you've built over the last few years? Yeah. Yeah, also there, the, the the marriage between data and analytics is important, right? Because we want to monetize both. Um, so basically we focus on, uh, sorry, let me switch that off. We focus on, uh, on four verticals, um, local government in particular in the context of, uh, of cities is um, the most important one, I would say. Uh, next to that, we focus on uh, Utility operators, in particular electrical utilities, uh, telco operators as a third vertical, and then the whole world of uh, of transportation operators. Those those are the the four verticals. And there, again, historically, we supported these uh, these verticals by by providing our data, right, and providing our customers access to that data. That's where we started to build the business. Um, typically, uh, our data get, gets quite deeply involved in in the use cases that we support, right? As these are all serious use cases to a large extent funded with, with public money. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, uh, transparency and good use of funding is important. And then over time with, as I said in the introduction, with well, customers becoming more demanding, society becoming more demanding um, and solutions becoming available, we started to migrate from, from data into, into analytics. And there again, the analytic solutions that we um, that we support are uh, very much complementary to to the verticals and and the use cases that that we started the business on. I mean, let me give you some examples if you want in in all four of them, right? So, in when it comes to local government, which is about fifty percent of our of our business, um, traditionally. Uh, our data is used quite extensively on the tech side of things. That's where I, I spoke earlier, right, with the company migrating from R&D focus into commercial focus in the Netherlands. That happened in 1997. And in 1997, some new legislation came into effect here in the Netherlands, where all municipalities were mandated to raise a real estate tax-based system. And that drove the original demand for accurate street level kind of data. Because when, when it comes to tax, um, an, an important principle is that tax measures that are taken by, by government are, are based on well, proper documentation, proper rule sets, but also independent kind of data. So all these municipalities in the Netherlands were looking for data to issue annual um, tax bills based on real estate value and street level data was a good source for that. Uh, originally, that was done by people responsible at the government to issue those tax bills, looking at the images and comparing images and based on that, deciding whether one house had a higher value than another house. Obviously, right now, uh, you can do all kind of uh, automated uh, analysis, right, and calculate the, the cubic meters content of a house, calculate the surface area, form yourself an opinion on um, on the kind of material that is used in the house, the condition of that, and all of that is an input to uh, to tax. Maybe the, the most exciting example, it was launched earlier this week uh, in that context, is um, a tax that has been raised by the city of Amsterdam, which is the capital in the Netherlands, as you know, um, to tax businesses based on the amount of advertising that they put up. Obviously, local 
governments are continuously looking for new sources of income. Um, certainly after COVID, that has become uh, a relevant theme. Uh, and the city of Amsterdam decided to, to introduce an advertising-based tax, which didn't exist before. And to my earlier point, they wanted to do that um, based on an independent source of data, right? And, and clearly there, um, 360 degree imagery, fully automated analytics is a much more independent source compared to sending an employee of the city onto the street and, and taking pictures or make, making an own judgment. Uh, so we have driven the city of Amsterdam three times. We've developed fully automated uh, solution to uh, to define um, advertising uh, in in the street and based on that the advertising the the tax was launched uh, a few weeks ago so all um, businesses in Amsterdam have been taxed now for the square centimeters of advertising that they have on their buildings and it was do all done in a fully automated fashion so that's that's another good example in in local government and maybe a last example to mention is uh, our data and our analytics being used for um, mobility. And clearly, in large cities, uh, mobility um, is one of the one of the more significant challenges, right? And a few examples, like again, there are post COVID, some of the larger cities in Europe, like Paris, like Milano, uh, decided to uh, to add bike based mobility to to the mix of mobility solutions in order to become less dependent on public transportation and the congestion created by cars. And in both these cities, uh, a new bike infrastructure had been designed pretty much based based on the kind of data that, uh, that we do. Um, so that's in, in local government context. When it comes to um, utilities, not that much difference between uh, telcos and, and electrical utilities that I spoke about before. Uh, but there, uh, both these operators manage large infrastructure networks, right, in uh, in North America, consisting of poles and cables above the ground in Europe, in quite a few countries, more below ground, but then you still have the, the different connection boxes where that infrastructure is uh, is coming, getting above the, um, the surface. Um, designing those networks, maintaining those networks, managing assets in these networks, and also putting new infrastructure in the ground, uh, accurate street level data and automated analytics um, are very useful sources. Here in the Netherlands, um, glass fiber is quite well penetrated. About 50% of the households in the Netherlands now have fiber, uh, but still the other 50% is to be done, right? And all these fiber cables need to be put in the ground. Um, makes a lot of difference cost-wise, time-wise, risk-wise, whether you do that on the sidewalk or on the main street and, and deciding that based on accurate street level data uh, supported with uh, with automated analytics is, is an important use case uh, for us. So those are some of the, the typical examples. And then for us, when uh, some of these use cases get uh, together uh, in the same location, in the same area of interest, in particular, a large city, obviously there comes an interesting business model because then you can use the same data for multiple use cases for multiple customers, which makes a lot of economic uh, sense. Yeah, so I think uh, this is very interesting. And I've seen that, you know, uh, for example, a use case of forecasting that a particular tree during uh, the fall might kind of, or rather during high wind levels can possibly fall on the utility lines and can disrupt electricity. Right, and then kind of giving a trigger uh, in a more proactive manner to uh, to the utilities, saying that you might want to trim it, cut it, uh, and kind of you know make sure that the network is safe. Uh, while uh, you know these problem statements are pretty profound, uh, what goes behind is a lot of data, a lot of processing, uh, and to be able to do that, a lot of data training, tagging, identifying objects lot of things that needs to be done for your model and analytics to work effectively. How have you, uh, you know, gone about it? Uh, because for example, if covering Amsterdam city uh, three times, uh, to be able to do that every time in a different way uh, at defined time intervals, 
uh, I think it's not an easy task. It's a, it's a pretty operationally heavy task. So what do you think has gone in more from a field operations perspective, more from data training perspective, and how have you been able to manage these dynamic changes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the $64 million question, right? How, how do you bring all of that together? I would say a couple of things, right? From, from a business perspective, um, what we find very important is that, that you focus on, on use cases that's, um, that, that have shared requirements between multiple customers. Because, because we learned when we started this, I mean, again, or originally we were data, then we added analytics. We started that about 10 years ago. And, and in the early days, if you're not careful, every customer has a different view on the world and have a different set of requirements. And then you can spend a lot of effort, a lot of manual effort, right? You don't get all of that automated to create an individual solution for an individual customer, which is nice, but which is maybe not uh, the most clever thing to do from, from a business perspective. So, so after that initial phase where we wanted to be everything for every customer, we've said, well, let's focus on the use cases that, that really make sense. So I think focus um, is, is important here because that allows you to build technology, that allows you to reuse data, that allows you to build to build automation, to, to focus on a limited set of use cases. So by now, uh, we have a, a catalog for, across these four verticals that I spoke about with... 20 solutions if you want. And, and that's what we want to focus on and we want to get better better on that all the time. Uh, clearly automation uh, is important. Uh, so we, we have built a platform allowing us to do that. And there again, the fact that we have our own data and the fact that we, we focus on creating analytics based on our own data helps us a lot, right? Because we know the, the spec of our own data in, inside out. Uh, so that's that platform uh, we've built over the years and, and works works well now. And then, yeah, as per your question, then obviously you have more simple objects, right? Like your traffic signs and light poles and road markings. And you have more complex objects like trees, which which change all the time, as you, you indicated. But still, uh, the, the automation of, of a defined set of objects... Um, we have quite well under control. Um, but having said that, given where we are and, and given the kind of customers that we support and, and the requirements that, that our customers have, which are typically in the <clears throat> 95, going up to 98% in terms of correctness and completeness, um, automation will in, in many cases not uh, not do all the work. So next to the automated part of it, there is a significant manual component, right? <clears throat> In order to um, to finalize the quality of the data set and also to convince ourselves and, and through that our customers that we, we deliver in line with their expectation and requirements. So we've built a platform which we internally refer to as Insights 360, sorry. <clears throat> and that Insights 360, if you want, has, has two legs. So one is it's the automation part of it, right? Building the training sets and then doing the detection on, on the data set. But as I said before, we know there's always a manual component uh, beyond that, which we typically uh, partner on with, uh, with partner companies who, who provide that part of the work. And we find it important to have an integrated platform where our partners can, can work in. So, so right after we have done the detection <clears throat> on the data, we open the platform to our production partners to do the manual part of the work. And that, that integrated part, <clears throat> which again, we refer to as Insights 360, has worked for us very, very well. And, and obviously that's linked to my first remark, right? That you can only structure a solution like that when you have a limited set of solutions that you, you focus on in, in building. And then over the last 24 months, we've added a module to that Insights platform called Insight, Insight Full, which is also applying uh, data analytics on production parameters, right? So that allows us to, uh, to monitor and to help uh, our colleagues and our partner staff who do that work and to make sure that we apply 
all the learning on the on the production side as well. So the whole notion of of, of the importance of data <clears throat> and the ability to analyze data in an automated fashion is also applied within within the production process itself. No, I think uh, this pretty much you know explains the way the entire um, you know use case works and the way you have built the platform and the approach. Uh, while ninety five percent is a very very good quality in terms of doing it in an automated way, uh, where have you seen largely the requirement of high accuracy like ninety eight percent, ninety ninety eight ninety nine percent coming into picture? Uh, you know, from a delivery standpoint, what the customers ask for, what um, you know needing, uh, or do you think that? It's a mental block that 95 and 98 is really not that big a difference. Yeah, you, you can argue uh, the difference between 95, 98. Um, and, and if, if you want that, even as a cultural component, we, we see different different views from different customers in different markets. But but I would say most important there, there Kapil, it's also a, a matter of educating customers. And, and we have examples um we're certainly new customers uh customers that are new to this space right or, and or customers that in, that involve uh, purchasing people or legal people right in in the whole purchasing cycle and then put put 100 requirements on the table right and and <clears throat> i mean i totally understand it that we should all strive for perfection but but 100 is is real perfection right and then when you take those more new customers through the reality, right? And also when you engage different uh, production methods, including human beings, right? People on the ground, where quite a few of the use cases that we focus on um, have historically been served by sending people outside, right? With, with a paper and pencil or with whatever devices to record. And, and people then sometimes have the perception that that is 100%. Well, we can clearly prove that that's not the case, right? So, I mean, it, it's it's very clear that for professional B2B use cases, your 80, 85%, which in some consumer use cases is acceptable, is not acceptable, right? And then that 95% is a kind of threshold. And then between 95 and 98, that's why I said it. It's not so easy to clearly establish what is the right number, right? Because it also depends a lot on how you measure in your sampling methodology, et cetera. But that's the whole debate about that 95 to 100%. I mean, that, that's an interesting debate with customers where we spend quite a bit of time educating our customers and, and where we're not shy of, of accepting that we need to, um, while we work with the customer, make it better over time, right? And then there maybe good uh, to to add when when you do a similar kind of, of analysis that's why we did Amsterdam three times when you do it multiple times obviously your data get better all the time right as you know so that that's clearly a component um and what what we are now also doing more and more and I started our conversation right that that for us we always marry data with with analytics <clears throat> but while we've now developed these, this portfolio of standard solutions on the analytics side, that also gives us the opportunity to integrate other data. So we have now started to create some additional data ourselves with, with lower cost sensors, but over time uh, bringing other data in from our customers into some of these solutions will also help uh continuously improving quality levels right because the more often you do this the the better the the results will uh, will get got it no i think uh and what i feel is that obviously it one it's very difficult to quantify two uh, you know obviously it is difficult to even convince uh, some of the customers to even tell them what is the importance of that quality or how do you really differentiate and what is the right number uh, we have seen it in number of use cases because we have been on both the sides to one um, implement scalable, uh, you know, data pipelines and along with our partner. Aspect 
looking at all the aspects of data, which is LIDAR, point cloud, uh, 2D, 3D, various use cases, more importantly, use cases like ADAS level uh, three and four, uh, and now medical AI, uh, right, which is basically uh, things like, say, detecting cancer at an early stage, uh, working with medical equipment companies, uh, they would want it to be really, really accurate because they want to make sure that they're giving the right input to the clinician. Uh, and obviously, I'm like, working at scale, we have realized that one, um, it is difficult to even quantify. Obviously, sampling methodology plays a very, very important trait, uh, role there. And also the fact that sometimes we have seen that, uh, you know, interpolation also kind of uh, uh, can become a very good uh, mechanism to see how you can even automate the predictability between the frames whenever you are covering long distances. Uh, very, very space to kind of build on. But, uh, you know, uh, even in this space, while you've got your data, uh, many of the customers with regard to training data sets have also spoken about synthetic data, right? And, uh, you know, then there is a debate about or between uh, how good and to what level uh, is synthetic data good vis-a-vis -vis what is the importance or need of real data? Uh, what has been your experience and what is your take uh, with the experience of delivering so many projects with your customers? Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, we we focus mostly on real data, but it, but it has everything to do right with where we started. When I say, well, for us, we, we for us, it always go together, right? We don't have independent analytics projects. Our projects always include capturing data and then uh, providing the analytics on that data. So we have uh, a lot of real data available uh, and it's it's an important part of our business model. Uh, we have created some tools to uh, to create synthetic data as well, which is certainly uh, because not every traffic sign is the same, right? So when and as we operate in multiple countries, uh, when you go into a new country using synthetic data to do the initial training, yeah, that that helps. So we've built some tools there. Um, which are part of the platform that I described before, but in, in the way how we conduct our business, um, it's the, it's the minority for the reasons that I, that I explained before. Great. Uh, before we move ahead, there is a, there is a question that you've got and we'll possibly just pick that any use cases of AI being deployed for large scale social impact that you are aware of. Mm, uh, we have in the US, we have we have one or two. Um, it depends how you define social impact. Uh, but but if the the one or two examples that we now have is that uh, together with a partner in the US, uh, we have done some projects where um, regional governments are are interested in. Uh, the overall social state of certain neighborhoods. And then they look at uh, factors like uh, unoccupied houses, uh, waste in the street, graffiti, uh, those kind of uh, components, which you can obviously uh, analyze in, in an automated fashion. Um, so yeah, that's what we have done in, in two larger cities in, in the US. Uh, and, and clearly there, uh, there is then a, a need for a relatively high update frequency, right? Because, well, one measurement doesn't tell you a lot. You want to understand how how that, that social score then develops over on a, on a per month basis or on a per three months basis. That's the only example that I'm aware of that, that we have been working on, which is something there is more demand coming for that in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, as we speak. No, I think uh, that is one second, which I actually picked up. Uh, and I think this has been experimented in Europe, uh, I think maybe Germany, uh, which is more like working with restaurants to kind of uh, curb down uh, on the wastage. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the use case is that we go out, we don't eat full, then it goes to waste. And basis that, it also kind of one gives you a measure of how much of wastage do you have. And two, uh, for even the restaurants, the benefit is that they would know how much of supply do they need to create uh, depending on what is getting wasted and uh, how can they basically educate the customers to kind of uh, order wisely, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's one social use case because 
the amount of waste that goes uh, can feed a million people right so and i think that can be a that can be a very huge uh, social impact if that answers your question nayak uh, thanks so uh, let's let's move on to the next one uh, you know you spoke about a lot of data being collected have you uh, you know operationalize your own vehicles do you collect uh, on field both in the us and in the european market how do you go about collecting data yeah no so uh, given the importance right of data and analytics we we collect our own data uh, both in in the us and in europe um the key the key attribute of our solution is the accuracy of of the data and and we have built our own ecosystem for that right so we we design our own cameras we have our own uh, processing software which includes some patterns to to secure that accuracy both from a from a location perspective as well as from a from a geometry uh, perspective within the the 360 uh, panorama um, and after the data is processed we uh, we provide our customers access to the data from the cloud as i as i mentioned before so we do that data collection ourselves it, it's quite scalable and, and very much designed to penetrate in new markets. And then because we have two operating models, like here in the Netherlands, we, we drive the entire country uh, every year. So here we have dedicated vehicles, dedicated cameras, dedicated people uh, doing that work. Uh, 2023 is the 13th year in a row that we drive the entire road network. So our colleagues have from the 1st of January to the 31st of December to do that work. And then when they're done before the 31st of January on, uh, sorry, 31st of December, on the 1st of January, they start again. Uh, however, when we go to new markets where we don't have people on the ground, then we can we can package these cameras in some flight cases. Uh, they can be installed in um, on, on regular passenger vehicles. Uh, so you can just rent uh, rent a car locally and install the camera, and then we typically hire a driver on on a part time basis. We can train drivers uh, remotely via the internet, and then we go about uh, capturing the data. After the data is captured, it's uploaded into the cloud, and then all the processing, uh, which is quite significant, is is done in the cloud. So that's our traditional way of working. Uh, we we do now have two additional models. They're not standalone, but they can be integrated. So we have developed a, a lower cost, lower spec camera, allowing our customers to do self collect. Right? You will recognize that in each of the four verticals in which we are active, uh, as they are all organizations that are active in the public space. These organizations typically employ people and vehicles to to go out in the field. Uh, so there is a growing demand uh, from our customers to also be able to collect data themselves that can be done with that camera that can be fitted on their own vehicles and then that data is integrated in our processing platform where it's geo-referenced against the premium data to to make sure that we have one one integrated data set and a third uh, way to collect data is we have founded a startup which is a sister company if you want um, that focuses on collecting data via dash cam and mobile phones, uh, also for integration into the same platform. So uh, those are the three methods that we use for street level data, um, but always in a controlled fashion and um, integrated in our own platform. We we are not in the business of, of integrating any, any third party data. Um, you could consider that and technically it's possible but but we believe it doesn't make a lot of value business wise and that's all on the street level side then obviously there's also a, a world where you want to collect data from an aerial perspective uh, we're not in aerial data ourselves but uh, we do integrate aerial data in in our ecosystem right so um, when we provide access our customers access to our data we do that through a software suite that we were developing ourselves called Street Smart. And there typically you can then enter an address and then you can look at that address, both from 
uh, a horizontal perspective as well as from a vertical perspective as, as quite a few use cases. Um, you want to have both views on an object, right? Uh, in the beginning, we spoke about houses and determining the value of a piece of real estate. Obviously, you can see a lot from a street level perspective, which we like. Uh, but you also want to know whether there is a swimming pool in the backyard, right? And that you can't see from a street level picture. They're having an aerial picture would uh, would help. So that that's how we how we go about uh, the the data collection side of things. No, great. I think uh, I think this is very interesting. In fact, uh, you know, I was wondering uh, some time ago uh, there was also an announcement uh, which was regarding um, you know covering. Uh, the aerial space as well, uh, running up to good few thousand kilometers in air and capture aerial data as well. Uh, you think uh, that is also something that uh, you know you are going to work upon and scale uh, because uh, for urban planning, uh, aerial data gives uh, you know a lot of value and in fact one of the largest uh, um, you know air carrier company has set up a data vertical to. Uh, sell that data in a in a much uh, larger fashion yeah yeah it's a, it's it's an important question and, and the answer is yes we're we're working on that um obviously if you want to build true uh, photorealistic 3d as per my earlier example on that house you need both right um and both uh, data sets are available now, right? Bo both in terms of imagery as well as in in lidar point clouds, allowing you to do to do through uh, 3D. So to reconstruct all of that together uh, is certainly possible. Uh, also, there the the technology in terms of meshing and and cloud based computing to uh, to support that is available now. One of the initiatives that we're having there is together with uh, with Hexagon, uh, who has a significant aerial business. Uh, so with Hexagon, we have created a concept uh, called SuperMesh, uh, which is all about taking accurate aerial data, street level data, and in a fully automated fashion, uh, integrating that into a, a photorealistic 3D world. Uh, we're rolling that out as we speak. Uh, the technology is available. We've given some demos last year at Intergeo. We've built some smaller samples. We're now building some larger samples where you should think about first cities getting getting built in, in that 3D environment. Um, it's interesting. It, it's a lot of work. It, it's expensive given the, the uh, computing power infrastructure that you require. Uh, and uh, I mean, two two answers related to the business side of things. The the fact that that both us as well as Hexagon have a, a model where the standalone data is already monetized, right? So so the data is available. So you, uh, in order to to justify the development of of that three D uh, experience, you only need to justify the the additional effort in order to build the three D. I believe that that helps because when you add all the costs, right, both the original data collection as well as the uh, creation of 3D, you talk about a significant amount of money. And if you only need to justify that by these new 3D based use cases, it, it could well become an uphill battle. So uh, in the initial phase, which we believe is the next one to two years, doing this as, a, as an incremental solution on top of the solutions that we already support, uh, is certainly feasible, uh, let's say both from a supplier perspective as well as in terms of creating the conditions in the market in order for this to take off. Uh, over time, uh, it could well be that, that the, the 3D experience replaces the, the current 2D experiences, right, that, that we have been speaking about, um, which, which is interesting uh, because you could also argue that when you have built a proper um, um, a proper um, photorealistic 3D representation, right? Based on based on metadata rather than on imagery, then you can also update that much more cost efficiently. Because yes, quite a lot changes, but it's still the minority that changes, right? So if you have that perfect 3D representation. And if you could then, based on parameters, decide, well, what is the same and what has changed, and you only 
focus on um, reproducing the changed part of the reality, uh, then there will be some some significant uh, efficiency <clears throat> created, uh, which I believe is is important and which will then over time uh, make the the 3D experience the 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 dominant experience. And and I add that point because. I mean, the world has been working on 3D for a long time, right? Before I, I went into the location business, I was in entertainment business and, and zillions of dollars have been spent on 3D movies and 3D TVs, and they never took off really in a significant way. I believe in the B2B markets where we are active, 3D will help a lot for the reasons that I mentioned before. And maybe last point to add there, which has nothing to do with our discussion, but which I find interesting. Um, the kind of companies that we support all have significant interaction with consumers, right? And um, the fact that the world is getting more and more complex also makes it more and more complex for these government organizations and businesses to communicate in a responsible manner with consumers and, and driving that communication based on photorealistic 3D, I believe is, is a significant opportunity, right? That will allow governments and businesses to properly explain to consumers what they're doing and how they are managing and changing the public space. So that's another element, again, completely independent of technology and independent of analytics, which will help drive adoption and create benefits for, for 3D digital twins. No, I think uh, that's anyways going to be very, very important uh, as we grow, cities grow, cities scale, uh, and the need for revenue also scale, particularly from a uh, you know public or the government use case perspective. Uh, there is no doubt about importance of 3D data in terms of how accurate or how close can you be for certain use cases, right? And whether it is uh, autonomous vehicle use case, whether it is a utility use case, whether it is uh, urban planning use case, right? It's, it's, it's going to be very, very important and critical. But at the same time, the 3D data comes with a huge cost of managing that data and the size, right? Uh, in terms of justifying what could be uh, a good investment or what could be the right amount of data, data that you would collect from a 3D uh, you know, data perspective, uh, you know, don't you think uh, that there has to be a balance between the amount of data and amount of uh, bandwidth or space that you're going to need, particularly when we are moving to cloud, uh, any amount of data that you keep is costly, right? So, and anyways, there is a static and then there is a variable cost. Uh, do you really think that, uh, you know, managing 3D data to the way that we have been talking about, uh, would become easier because these are high accuracy and uh, precise applications. So you cannot really compromise on the quality of data as well. Uh, have you been able to crack a code wherein you're kind of uh, converting a high quality or high resolution data into a low quality and then storing and then restoring the quality uh, to kind of optimize the usage of space on cloud because most of the customers would ask you the same question in terms of operating and maintaining uh, such a heavy data set. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's certainly a factor uh, by all means, right? And it's probably one of the reasons why we're talking about 3D for such a long time and, and the, re the reality as well as the uptake of it is, is limited. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we continue to work on creating technology that allows us to, to address this. But the other three factors um, are important, which were a part of my previous answer, right? So one is, in our case, the data is already there, right? And then the data is, is paid for, which, which means that we talk only about the incremental cost rather than the full cost. And that makes, makes a factor five difference, if you want. So that, that's a significant step, one. Two, uh, when you do this properly, the cost of updating will go significantly down, uh, which is also very important, I believe. And three, if we then are able to create new justifications for this kind of data, which I strongly believe is in, is in consumer and citizen communication and interaction, if you add those three elements up, up, while in parallel technology, like always, will help us drive costs down, yeah, then I think uh, this, this will absolutely work. I mean, this is 
in my opinion, um, the, the next big thing in, in our industry, right? And you have all the the large consumer tech companies talking about their their metaverses, right? In, as as a as a platform, as an ecosystem to support new consumer use cases, which I totally understand. But but for businesses like like ours, creating the professional metaverse of a city, I mean that's exactly what we're talking about, right? And whether you then call it metaverse or universe or digital twin, that we can debate forever. But but the notion of <clears throat> of being that yeah, real digital twin, allowing people managing the public space to to do even better, right, and to work more efficient and more responsible and and more faster with, with a better return. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? And then, yeah, uh, technology, uh, the amount of data, uh, processing time, transmission time, those are all challenges, but they will be solved. And, and there's good economic benefit and reason to, to make sure that they get solved as well. I, I strongly believe in that. Great. Um, I think the time is flying, right? I've got lots and lots of questions, but we are just left with 10 minutes. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the growth, uh, where do you see uh, the market growing? What's your prediction uh, or forecast of the growth for next three to five years for the market that you have been into? And how do you see the European and the US market uh, reacting uh, over the next three to five years? Yeah. Yeah, indeed, we're only active in Europe and US. Uh, so we're, we're not active on, on other continents. So I find that uh, hard to, uh, to judge. Uh, we're very optimistic. Uh, as, as a business, we have been growing uh, 20 to 30% in terms of revenue over the last 10 years um, every year, with the exception of, of 2020, where there were obviously some COVID-related challenges. And, and we see no reason uh, why that growth would, would stop. At, at the contrary, the world is getting more demanding. The world is getting more complex. The world's uh, asked more and more for for getting more done with with less resources and 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 we believe that that's the the space in which we operate uh we've recently engaged um an external consulting firm to to look again at at the market uh and they confirmed that that the the market is uh, many multiple times larger compared to to what we serve uh, today um so we're, we're very optimistic as far as that is concerned um we believe that there is quite a bit of um, demand that needs to be developed because there are not that many players in this space right uh and, and they're the, the the companies and and the departments and the use cases if you want that we support are not new at all right many of these use cases have existed for decades that means that, that they're also managed by by departments that are not necessarily the most innovative and the most forward looking right so so we believe that the opportunity is significant and that it takes significant effort to develop the opportunity right that's why we see ourselves not only as a as a technology company and as a production company but also as a, as a company that needs to excel in business development and and opening doors at, at new customers um, that's the second remark. And, and the third remark is when, when you look at the world, right, in, in, in which urbanization continues to grow, so, so cities continue to, to be uh, places that are very complex to manage, right, in terms of mobility, in terms of environment, in terms of access to, to resources, uh, consumers living in these cities are getting more demanding, right, and they, they want to be properly served, they want that to be done in a responsible manner, they want transparency on how their money is being spent. Well, all of that uh, drives the use cases that um, that we support. Um, and, and you see that, right? So post, post COVID in particular, in quite a few countries, both in Europe and in the United States, significant funding has been made available to, to drive these markets, right? Telco, infrastructure vital transportation infrastructure very important utility i mean you can't live without those three right and those are three of the verticals that we support um <clears throat> all three verticals have quite all the infrastructures right when, when you sometimes look at how 
how old these cables and these light poles are, it's it's to some extent scary, right? And they need to be monitored, they need to be maintained, and they need to be renewed at some point in time. So, no, they're the kind of things that that's that we do. Um, I strongly believe that that will continue to grow in a, in a very healthy fashion. No, I think I think this is right because I was talking to uh, you know a good friend that here, right, and uh, here is doing some work in Indian market as well. Right. So, in fact, one of the states, uh, they are mapping the entire, uh, you know, utility lines to find out the point of failure. Correct. Because uh, when you are in a complex uh, uh, network, it becomes extremely difficult to find the point of failure itself. Right. And particularly for, for a country like India, wherein uh, the utility, utility lines are above the ground uh, and then 70 to 80 percent of the landscape is rural right wherein only 20 25 30 percent is urban area it becomes extremely difficult to track and sometimes it takes maybe a few hours and maybe sometimes a day to reach to the point of failure right so uh, i can pretty much correlate with what you said in terms of uh, the use cases are more need based and the demand needs to be created so uh, couldn't agree more on the fact that uh, you know, the market is is poised to grow. Uh, and I also believe that uh, within the space that you operate, there is enough for you to do, right? And uh, I think I think it's going to be very interesting to see, um, you know, how does it shape up? Uh, maybe one last question from my side, uh, Frank. US and Europe, um, you know, uh, do you think that uh, it's the European market that is kind of... Uh, you know, growing your business really fast and well, or you think uh, the U.S. market, that's one. Second, uh, in terms of the use cases, uh, I heard you talk about mobility, uh, you know, use cases as well, and you talked about urban planning use cases as well. Uh, which one do you see growing fast? Yeah. Yeah, between the, um, between the two continents, um, I find it hard to to judge which which of the two is more promising. Uh, certainly, pre-COVID, uh, we were growing very fast in the U.S. Uh, then, in my personal opinion, U.S. was hit a bit harder by COVID compared to to the markets in Europe where we are active. And certainly, when you want to grow as a business, right, you need new customers, and when customers are hard to get hold of because people work from home. Uh, it has an impact on on your growth. So so pre COVID, we had decided to um, to in, increase our investment in Europe, and and that's that worked out well for us. But but I believe that that from an opportunity perspective, um, the, the the two continents are are quite comparable in terms of verticals. Uh, I mean the, the the markets that we support, as I mentioned before, are, are to some extent conservative. So that means long sales cycles, uh, and and that also has then an impact on on answering your question. Uh, what what markets are more promising? Right. I, I said a number of times that for for us cities are very important. I mean they will never disappear. Right. Cities will continue to grow. They will get more complex. There will always be new challenges. Uh, when it comes to um, to telco, uh, the the rollout of fiber and also the rollout of 5G is is a significant opportunity related to um, to the kind of things that we do. Uh, however, is that something that will demand uh, annual updates? Uh, probably not, right? When you have installed a new digital infrastructure, yeah, you want to maintain it and you want to monitor it within the first years probably not every year every six months but more on a, on a two to three year update frequency so there is there is some nuance on on every market i would say uh, which you need to look at um legislation is another factor right uh, in both us and in Europe, there are now these initiatives to significantly uh, address the number of fatalities on 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 the road. Right? Well, that that's a significant drive to get um, proper view on on the road infrastructure. Is that something that will go on forever? Um, question. Got it. Understood. I think I think it has been uh, you know uh, phenomenal and a, and a great experience talking to you. Uh, you know about 
this whole space of data infrastructure and the kind of analytics you do. And the problem that you'll be largely solving from the way Cyclomedia started to how the organization of the company is kind of helping businesses, uh, companies, uh, governments solve large scale problems. Uh, and I'm sure that if we continue to talk, we will be just on and on, but uh, the, the time tells me that we need to put a pause here. Uh, so I would like to thank you for all the insights that you have shared, uh, you know, about the work, uh, about the space, the need, the challenges, and, uh, you know, what has been your approach uh, to solve this. I'm sure that we will continue to have uh, much longer uh, chats. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, I would, I would obviously want to chat after this call, continue to talk to you for maybe about five minutes, because I think uh, there's a lot more that we can talk and kind of uh, people would have a lot many more questions to kind of look at how can Cyclomedia uh, solve specific use cases like the social impact, uh, like more in complex infrastructure market like India, uh, unlike US and Europe, wherein things are largely sorted long distance. Uh, I think we would, we would certainly talk more on that. So we'll take a pause here. I would like to thank you for joining this very, very interesting conversation, Frank. Uh, I'm sure that even at 5S, where we've got more than 1,500 plus uh, you know, data annotators working on data pipelines would be extremely, extremely uh, you know, happy to hear uh, the kind of problems that are being looked into the market and uh, how, how we can actually contribute at a much, much larger scale. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kapil. It has been a pleasure. Uh, interesting conversation. Thanks a lot.